Post-World War II Balance of Power, the Cold War. This is Unit 7, ladies and gentlemen. In this unit, we'll be talking about the first part of the Cold War, uh, in addition to some other ideas associated with uh, power between nations, the usage of weapons, uh, the arms race in particular between the United States and the Soviet Union, and some other things. Uh, just to start out with a little bit of background information, uh, after World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union emerged as the two superpowers of the world. That really means that they were, uh, in the absence of European power, Britain and France were essentially broke because of World War II. Uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were the two most powerful countries in the world. They had the largest militaries uh, and the most financial resources to draw from. Um, the problem was they had competing ideological systems, meaning uh, Western capitalist democracy in the United States and Soviet-style communism in the USSR. Uh, these ideological systems um, really covered everything from the way they lived their lives, their political system, and the way their economies functioned were basically diametric opposites, that is, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And in both cases, the U.S. and the USSR hoped to spread their ways of life to the outside world, which is sometimes referred to as the third world, uh, countries that were neither capitalist democracy nor uh, Soviet-style communism. So Western countries like the United States wanted to spread, spread democracy and capitalism, and Soviet leaders wanted to promote the spread of communism. So we're looking at a little T-chart here which compares the political, individual, and economic similar uh, differences between Western democracies like the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, politically, our side of the world, meaning the U.S., citizens elect representatives and national leaders. Um, People have the right to form their own political parties and basically to speak their mind, whereas in the Soviet Union, uh, you had a party dictatorship controlled by the communist uh, political party. Uh, it was the only political party allowed in the country, uh, and any difference of opinion tended to be uh, done away with. And we saw that when we talked about uh, totalitarian government uh, under Joseph Stalin. Individually, on our side of the world here, during the... Uh, the Cold War period. Uh, citizens have basic rights such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to choose their religion. Um, these are some of the, the most basic ideas associated with our society. Um, and these are ideas that really go back to the Enlightenment, which we spoke about at the beginning of the year. Uh, on the other side of the coin here, in the Soviet Union, you're dealing with um, a system where the government controlled radio, TV, and the newspapers. Uh, secret police would arrest all critics of the government. Um, particular practice of religion was discouraged because it tended to uh, diminish the attention being paid to the leadership of the government. So even the idea of God was basically disparaged or discouraged because it seemed to divert people's attention and devotion uh, away from the government and toward a god. So that kind of idea would be discouraged in a place like the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, and the big difference, another big difference here between Western democracies and Soviet communism has to do with economics. Uh, under capitalist system, people and corporations own business. They provide goods and services in order for, to make a profit. Um, you know, this goes back again to the Enlightenment, the idea that John Locke put forth that Property is good, and it's government's uh, place to protect people's rights to own property, okay? Um, but this idea could not be more strongly uh, opposed uh, than it was in the Soviet Union. Uh, private property of any kind would be abolished uh, and would be replaced with state ownership and central planning. The government would control the production of all goods uh, and how much of it. Um, there was no such thing as private farming, meaning people owning farms for a profit. Instead, the state, meaning the government, controlled uh, farms which employed hundreds, in some cases thousands, of 
farmers who were then uh, made to turn over their produce to the government for distribution to the people. Um, the whole idea behind this goes back to Karl Marx. Basically, Karl Marx felt that the idea of uh, private ownership was bad because it created class distinctions. Uh, some people inevitably wind up with more than others, and that's something that needs to be avoided in society. So when the Soviet Union was established under the communist model, the whole idea of private property was done away with. Now, following World War II, um, immediately following World War II, uh, is really when the Cold War period begins. Um, when we talk about the Cold War, it usually, you know, the discussion usually lasts roughly from the years 1944 until 1991. And as we just spoke about in our World War II unit, we talked about the Yalta Conference in 1944, which was a meeting between Winston Churchill, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin, uh, where they made plans to configure the post-war world. Remember, this, this meeting occurred towards the end of the Second World War, and these three leaders were basically deciding, when we do eventually defeat Germany, what are we going to do with the country and Europe? And ultimately, the decision was to divide Germany into four separate zones of occupation. The United States would take a zone, Britain would take a zone, uh, the Soviet Union would take a zone in the east, and even France would get a piece of Germany. And really, the, the promise that Roosevelt and Churchill got out of Stalin was that when the war would end, he would allow for the free election of some form of government in the Soviet zone. Now, it almost goes without saying that the United States and Britain wanted democracy in Germany, and the Soviet Union would want communism in Germany. But ultimately, what they got from Stalin was a promise not to rig the elections. Stalin did not keep that promise, and he did rig the elections. So he didn't keep his promise, um, and ultimately... Communism was ushered in in the Soviet zone of occupation or the eastern part of Germany um, with an overwhelming margin, meaning people, uh, you know, the results of the, of, the, of the vote basically indicated that 99 or 98 percent of the people of eastern Germany wanted communism, which was absolutely, a, you know, a fabrication. That was not actually the truth. So what winds up happening is the Soviet army, which was in place throughout Eastern Europe, if you look at the map there to the right, the nations uh, indicated in red, particularly the smaller nations of Eastern Europe, these were the places that the Red Army or the Soviet army occupied in the last years of World War II. After the Battle of Stalingrad and the pushing of the German army back into Germany, basically the Soviet army never left Eastern Europe. So the gov basically these ar the army set up puppet governments which were headed by local communists, meaning in places like Eastern Germany and Poland, uh, Germans and Poles who were communists were ushered into power through the strength of the Soviet government and the Soviet army. These nations like Eastern Germany and Poland and some of these other, uh, other uh, smaller nations would become known as the Soviet satellite states, and that's an important term to remember. Satellite states refers to the Eastern European nations during the Cold War that were under the political, economic, and social domination of the Soviet Union. Uh, Stalin established these puppet satellite states because he felt that a buffer zone was needed between Western Europe, of uh, Britain and France in particular, and Italy, and Western Germany, and the Soviet Union to prevent uh, a capitalist democratic invasion. So by 1946, it's a pretty complicated state of affairs in Europe. Only a year or so after the end of the Second World, you have Winston Churchill, who is now the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, declaring that an Iron Curtain had descended across Europe. And what Churchill means by this idea of an Iron Curtain is that it's almost as if the European continent or subcontinent had been divided into two halves capitalist democratic Western Europe and communist Eastern Europe. Um, the two sides were becoming unrecognizable to one another. Trade between Eastern and Western Europe was cut off, 
and these Eastern European satellite states were forced to adopt communist economies uh, and follow policies dictated by the Soviet Union. So this means economies that the government controls all aspects of production, uh, the abolition or, or of private property, all the things that go along with communism, control of the press, things like that, all of these things are going to be adopted in these Eastern European satellite states. Now, very often people ask, you know, why is it that the United States is so involved in everything in other parts of the world? Well, this is really the beginning of that. Um, if you'll recall, when we discussed World War I, the United States uh, sort of shunned or turned away from involvement in the world after that conflict. So in the 1920s, the U.S. reverted to a, a spirit of isolationism. Well, the same thing is not going to happen after World War II. You, know, you see a picture here to the right. President Harry Truman is really going to take an active role in persuading Americans to sort of um, take on an active role in the world because of the power, economic and military, of the United States. There was some fear on the part of the British and the French and the Americans that Stalin was another Hitler looking to start a war. Um, and the only country that could really stand in his way, or at least it was, it was seen this way, was the United States. So the U.S. would not follow a policy of isolationism after the Second World War, uh, and under President Harry Truman's leadership, it would go on to take a much more active role in world affairs, which is really a situation that continues to this day. And one way the United States could take an active role in affairs throughout the world was by assisting countries we saw as friends and resisting countries or groups or movements that we saw as enemies or foes. Uh, one such opportunity for this occurred in 1947 um, when Britain was forced because of financial reasons to withdraw troops from Greece uh, who were supporting um, a resistance movement for a communist takeover. So in other words, local Greeks with Soviet support were threatening to take over the government. Now, if you remember from Global Nine, Greece is the birthplace of democracy, so propaganda-wise, it would really look bad for the Western world if communism took over in the, the cultural hearth of Western democracy. So ultimately here, Truman's going to announce that the U.S. is going to give money and supplies and support to Greece and Turkey in order to prevent a communist takeover. And, and this is sort of the first example of something that becomes known as the Truman Doctrine. Um, where he is basically offering to support anybody in the world uh, who is resisting a communist takeover, uh, they, can, they can count on American help. And here it is, the Truman Doctrine. Ultimately, this was President Harry Truman's idea, and this is going to be something that becomes a guiding policy throughout the Cold War years. So in the late 1940s, throughout the 50s and 60s, and even a bit into the 70s and 80s, the United States is going to do whatever it can to aid people who want to resist communism. Um, this marks the beginning of America's policy of containment, which we'll talk about in one minute. Um, sometimes you hear about nations who took aid, and remember, the, the Soviet Union was doing the same thing on the other side. So anybody uh, thought to... Uh, be wanting to bring in communism into their country, the idea was they could count on Soviet support. Sometimes um, clever leaders in different countries um, sort of milked the system and they took money and aid from both sides, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. India was an example of this. Um, they took money from both sides, enriching their country to a certain degree. I don't know if you could say they became rich, but they certainly benefited from the, from the financial aid being offered by the Soviet Union in the United States. But they remain non-aligned, meaning they didn't pledge uh, in full support of, for either communism or capitalist democracy. Um, so we refer to these nations as non-aligned or neutral nations. Very often these nations were part of the third world, and the term third world is a term that really is uh, referring to countries that were neither first world, meaning capitalist democracies, nor second world, meaning communists like the Soviet Union. Uh, these third world countries were basically the nations that 
uh, or non-aligned nations were the nations that the United States and the Soviet Union were trying to get on board with our way of life. We were trying to attract as many people and as many nations as we possibly could to our way uh, to the detriment of the Soviet way, trying to prevent people from going that way. In the last slide, we mentioned briefly the term containment. Now, the definition here of containment, the United States would not try to overturn communism where it already existed, but would take steps to prevent it from spreading further. This is an important idea associated with the Cold War. This is just as the Truman Doctrine promised to support people who were uh, resisting communism where it, where it doesn't exist currently. Um, this is another one of the sort of major Cold War policies that, that sort of served to define what the Cold War was and, and how it would be waged between the United States and the Soviet Union. The big idea here is the U.S. wasn't going to provide money and support to people who are currently living under communism. So that means the people of Eastern Europe, the people inside the Soviet Union, and eventually the people in China. Um, it's not that the United States was going to actively work to uh, overthrow those nations. Um, the idea was to simply contain communism where it already exists and to try to not let it spring up, so to speak, or pop up in any new nations. And the reason for that was it was seen as um, sort of out of bounds or, or, or you know, out of the question to um, try to overturn the system inside the Soviet Union or inside Eastern Europe in those satellite states, um, that such a thing would be considered like an act of war. And in the nuclear age, that could be very, very dangerous, a direct war uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. That's why it's, it's a good thing, in, uh, historically speaking, that the Cold War remained cold, meaning the United States and the Soviet Union never actually, not directly at least, fought one another. Um, during this period from 1944 or so until 1991. But the United States would take steps to prevent communism from popping up in new lands, like in Greece, like we said, uh, and Turkey, and in some other places. These are gonna be ultimately the reasons for the Korean War and the Vietnam War to prevent the rise of communism in nations where it does not currently exist. Another way to prevent communism from popping up, and in particular, one way of preventing it from popping up in Western Europe, our closest allies, countries like Britain, France, and Italy, was by uh, providing billions of dollars in aid to European nations uh, to help them rebuild after World War II. Remember, World War II, much of it was fought on the European subcontinent, specifically in Italy and in France and in Germany. Communism grows where there's poverty, and there was a lot of poverty following World War II in 1946, 47, 48, really up through the early 50s. So the United States, in particular, um, George Marshall, um, they come up with a plan. American official Marshall comes up with a plan to provide recovery <coughs> relief uh, money to Western European countries to help them reboot their industry, so to speak build their factories back up, um, build up their towns to a certain degree, get people working again so that we can create future trading partners, which in the end, the more prosperity there is in, East, in Western Europe, there's far less uh, probability of communism springing up, meaning successful communist movements in places like Italy and France and Britain. Um, so if the people in those countries are prosperous and happy, the idea this is the best Basically, the best antidote to communism is by helping uh, create future trading partners with the United States. And that's what Marshall Plan money uh, was really supposed to do. Now, we said um, immediately, you know, during the Yalta conference, the decision was made to divide Germany into zones of occupation, um, which was done. That was, that was done. Um, and really, for the first couple of years after the war, all the zones sort of worked together, but you know, as 1948 approached, it was becoming clear that the United States, Britain, and France, on one hand, were, uh, you know, had some very different ideas about what they wanted Germany to be than their kind of erstwhile Soviet ally, meaning the alliance system that brought uh, 
the U.S., Britain, and the Soviet Union throughout the Second World War was actually ending at this point. The Soviet Union wanted to go one way with their zone, meaning to make it communist, and the Western countries, meaning the United States and Britain, wanted to go another way with their zone. So, in 1948, Britain, the United States, and France merged their zones of occupation in Germany, meaning they made it one large uh, uh, political entity. Um, and the Soviets saw this as an, kind of an act of aggression, almost as if Britain and France and the U.S. were sort of ganging up on the Soviet Union to put, their, put pressure on them to sort of release Eastern Germany, um, you know, from from what was becoming clear that they wanted it to become a communist nation. So what the Soviets did in response to the Western merging of their zones was closing all highways and transportation into and out of Berlin. If you look to the map to the right there, the city of Berlin, which was the capital of Germany, was deep inside the Soviet zone of occupation in Germany. And if you remember from our discussion of Yalta, we said that Berlin... Uh, Berlin itself, the city, was actually divided in very much the same fashion as the rest of Germany. So the picture to the left there is actually a picture of the city of Berlin, a map of the city of Berlin, which was deep inside the Soviet zone. But if you see, the eastern part of Berlin was controlled by the Soviet Union, but the western part, uh, on the page here, the part to the left, you could see an American flag, a British flag, and a French flag, uh, in the different parts. So what that means is Berlin was divided very much the same way as the rest of Germany. So what the Soviets actually did was they closed all transportation off into and out of Berlin. The idea was to get the Americans, the British, and the French to leave Berlin. This is really where the Cold War begins to heat up. This is where it becomes clear that the Soviet Union is not, no longer going to work with its former allies. And these two... Uh, Basically, these two forces, U.S., Britain, and France on one side and the Soviet Union on the other, were going to go in two different ways. Now, this was a very dangerous situation in 1948 because the, the closing of, the, uh, of, uh, of Berlin, basically the isolating of it from the rest of Germany, meant that uh, the people who were, you know, American, French, British, and the people who lived in Western Berlin were now isolated. They, they couldn't heat their homes. They couldn't feed themselves. There was nothing that could go into or come out. Um, and this, this was a problem. If the United States, Britain, and France simply packs up and leaves, it looks like a major victory for the Soviet Union. If we decide to fight, um, well, that's a big problem because by this time the Soviet Union has nuclear weapons. So if our, you know, if we basically pull a tank onto the main road into Berlin and try to blast our way in, um, that's, that's a big problem. That could start World War III. So the Allies, the United States and Britain in particular, kind of launch an ingenious plan to kind of circumvent the Soviet blockade of the roads. The way that we were going to do this was by airlifting food and supplies, fuel, coal, oil, things like that, airlifting this stuff directly into the city. So a major, major uh, airlift campaign began in 1948 to feed and supply the city. Planes flew into and out of the uh, western part of Berlin 24 hours a day. Um, and they did this, you know, morning, noon, and night, every single day for about 11 months. Uh, and although it was extraordinarily difficult, by the end of the Berlin airlift, the, uh, the process of giving the supplies to the city was actually, it was giving the people more than they needed. So this was sort of a miracle of organization and logistical planning. Uh, and it sort of shows the Soviets that the Western nations aren't going to back out of Western Berlin. Um, and after about a year, about 11 months, the Soviet Union will lift the blockade. And very shortly after, we're going to see the birth of two new nations here. Um, in 1949, the three Western zones are going to merge into an independent nation called the Federal Republic of Germany. Now, that's, that's West Germany. That's democratic capitalist Germany. That's our Germany, so to speak. The Soviets are going to turn their zone into a communist state, 
really to confuse you here, they're going to name it the German Democratic Republic. Okay, so the GDR, or East Germany, German Democratic Republic, is actually Communist Germany. Whereas the Federal Republic of Germany, meaning the FRG, is actually Capitalist Democratic Germany. All right, so don't get confused. Just because it says German Democratic Republic, it's it's not the capitalist. It's not the Germany that's that's basically on our side. This is the GDR, German Democratic Republic, is Communist Eastern Germany, a satellite state of the Soviet Union under the political, social, and economic domination of Moscow. So by 1949, it's very clear that... Uh, a new geopolitical situation exists between uh, the former allies of World War II. The alliance system that had guided uh, the world through the Second World War and had achieved the destruction of Nazi Germany was definitely no more at this point. So the Western democratic capitalist nations are going to take steps to defend themselves from what they saw as uh, Stalin's um, sort of aggression and they're going to take steps to um, pr protect themselves in the event that the Soviet Union were to invade Western Europe. So you see the creation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The goal was to protect Western Europe from communist aggression. And basically the United States makes a pledge here to, to say an attack on London to the U.S. Is, or an attack on Paris is very much like an attack on New York. Uh, the United States will use its nuclear arsenal to defend Western Europe from Soviet aggression. So this was supposed to be sort of a permanent, um, you know, detriment to the Soviet Union getting any ideas of expanding beyond the Eastern European satellite states. So what we're looking for here ultimately is the status quo. Western Europe uh, will stay democratic and capitalist, whereas Eastern Europe will remain communist. And by 1955, you see the Soviet or communist um, sort of answer to NATO, which is what the Warsaw Pact is. It's, it's essentially the same thing as NATO, but for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. The Warsaw Pact nations, uh, their pledge is essentially to defend Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union from uh, the attack of Western democratic nations. So you see two sort of competing alliance systems here uh, during the Cold War. Now, we, we need to look a little bit about China, uh, look at China here. Um, you know, last time we talked about China, we, it was really at the, you know, we mentioned it briefly in our discussion of World War II with the attack, Japanese attack, things like that. But the last time we had any kind of major discussion about China, it was really the beginning of the 20th century with the uh, revolution which ended the last monarch uh, or ended the monarchy in China. And really that was the revolution, the nationalist revolution of Sun Yat-sen. Um, really in the meantime, from the teens, the 20s, and the 30s, China was in a period of kind of prolonged civil war. And eventually, it'll be the Chinese communists who come out of that civil war victorious. So we'll give a little bit of background information about that, uh, and then we'll move through the changes that the Chinese communists, particularly under the leadership of Mao Zedong, uh, will make. Chiang Kai-shek, um, was a general and a nationalist who um, united China in 1928, but like I said earlier, sort of faced a constant struggle initially with uh, communists under the leadership of Mao Zedong. And then after 1931, he was dealing very much with the Japanese invaders, um, which is really the invasions that, that kind of drag uh, Japan and the United States into the Second World War. So Chiang Kai-shek was the nationalist leader of China who was trying to keep the country together in the 1920s and 30s. Now, Mao Zedong was sort of like Chiang Kai-shek's counterpart. He was the communist leader who um, really made a lot of promises to the Chinese peasants, of whom there were many. Um, there was incredible poverty in China. Uh, and as we've said earlier, communism tends to grow and breed 
in places where there is poverty because people who have nothing aren't afraid of losing property. So Mao Zedong became extraordinarily popular amongst China's peasantry because he promised uh, equal distribution of land and land reform and the ending of, you know, sort of aristocratic ownership of land and things like that. So he became extremely popular. Um, sort of, sort of, he kept his guerrilla army um, in the field throughout the 1930s, initially fighting against Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists, but then um, fighting against the Japanese after their invasion. Uh, in 1931. He leads what's called this Long March, which is a major strategic retreat uh, after the Japanese invasion of China. And it, it sort of re it's sort of seen as, as a heroic retreat because, realistically speaking, that the communists should have been annihilated after the Japanese invasion. However, um, Mao Zedong, through the skill of his leadership and his personal charisma, was basically able to keep his army from completely disbanding and giving up during this time. And then this was a treat that retreat that lasted thousands and thousands of miles. So that's no small feat. That's not an easy task, keeping an army motivated, keeping morale high when they know they're actually running away from a fight. So Mao Zedong somehow was able to succeed uh, in preventing the destruction of his army long enough for it to actually unify uh, with their former enemies, the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek. So for a short time, <coughs> throughout, for a short, well, reasonably short time throughout World War II, uh, inside of China, there was actually this resistance to the Japanese invasion uh, that came from the unification of communists and nationalists. And when I say nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek, I mean these were this was the army that was supposed to represent democratic China, uh, capitalist China. So again, as we've been talking about the Cold War and some of the tensions between capitalists and democratic nations, um, you could see that it, it actually was not easy to keep this sort of alliance between the communists and the nationalists together. And it does not stay together for very long, particularly after the defeat of the Japanese uh, after August of 1945, <clears throat> when the Japanese finally surrendered to the United States and they no longer uh, pose a threat to China, uh, fighting will resume between the communists and the nationalists. Um, ultimately, the communist victory comes uh, when Mao's army drives the army of Chiang Kai-shek out of mainland, mainland China to the small island uh, off the coast uh, of Taiwan. Um, and sort of an interesting thing here, the creation of two Chinas. From the point of view of the United States, and again, the United States would support Chiang Kai-shek, and again, this goes back to the Truman Doctrine a little bit, because he was, after all, <clears throat> fighting communists. So the United States supported Chiang Kai-shek, and really for a very long time, until the 1970s, the United States does not recognize the existence of communist China. Uh, the only China, according to the U.S. government, that was a legal political entity was actually Taiwan. Um, and although the idea of it is silly because the, I mean, look at the map, China was mainland China and it was under the control of Mao Zedong and the communists, it, it sort of presents or represents a, a kind of stubborn side of the United States government in that it refused to um, recognize uh, the the nation that it had not supported or the group, the political group that it had not supported. And this goes along with the entire Cold War thing. The United States during the Cold War was in the, the business, so to speak, of resisting communism. So everything it did uh, was to try to prevent the growth of communism further. And by not recognizing the existence of communist China, that was one way of, or one supposed way of doing it. So Mao Zedong, there he is, um, because the United States was the major player inside the UN, uh, communist China was not allowed to join the United Nations, and Mao Zedong is going to make a number of changes uh, to China once he grabs power. We're going to see the inculcation of communist beliefs, 
um, the eliminate the the attempted elimination of the capitalist class of people. So if you're a capitalist, if you're a profit motive kind of person, then you had no place in Mao Zedong's China. Um, and even the authority of the family, which is a long-standing Chinese tradition, when you th talk about Confucian ideas like filial piety and things like that, um, Mao Zedong is going to enact policies which seek to replace um, <clears throat> the authority of the family uh, with that of the Communist Party. So we'll see a number of things over the next couple of slides here. The Great Leap Forward, the Five-Year Plan, Sino-Soviet Split, and the Cultural Revolution, all of these things uh, would fall under the category of the impact of Mao Zedong uh, on China during his time. <coughs> uh, and a lot of these things actually have precedence. You know, when we talked about the Soviet Union during the 1920s and farm collectivization, five we actually used the term five-year plans as well under Joseph Stalin, a lot of these are the same ideas that had earlier been enacted inside the Soviet Union. So we're going to see cooperative farms. And remember, a cooperative farm is a place um, where many people work together. They're either they're all employees of the government. Um, and the idea is every so often government officials arrive and trucks arrive to take the produce, whatever crops are harvested on a particular farm. Uh, they're there to take those the harvests and to equally distribute that stuff to the people, in this case of China. And again, the same problems that uh, the Soviet Union ran into when they did this are going to be encountered in China as well. When you're not paying people, there's very little incentive to actually work. So one thing that China will experience during the 1950s is uh, widespread starvation and hunger um, because people simply... If they're not being paid, people don't work. Um, and unfortunately, uh, when when you were dealing with farms and the food production of a country, uh, that unfortunately leads to starvation. Five-year plan, very much like in the Soviet Union. The idea was to modernize and modernize China and turn it into an industrial power. So Mao Zedong and the communist officials in China are going to decide that roads, dams, bridges, factories, uh, these are what modern nations build. So all the resources are going to be put aside to build those roads, dams, bridges, and factories. Um, but unfortunately, uh, while the resources were pu being put aside for these things, um, they were not being put aside for some of the other things that the Chinese people really needed. In some cases, um, teams, you know, thousands of people worth of teams were put aside to build these roads and bridges, uh, and not enough people were allotted to bring in the harvest. So again, this is going to lead to an economic crisis. It's going to lead to starvation. Um, and again, very much like in the Soviet Union, the five-year plan, the idea behind it was to decide uh, what to produce and, and how much of it to produce instead of letting a market determine what is produced, like what we have in a capitalist uh, democratic country. Now, just because the Soviet Union and China were both communist countries, doesn't mean they actually got along with each other. And as a matter of fact, this term here, the Sino-Soviet split, <coughs> This means, Sino in this case means China, so this is really the Chinese-Soviet split. Um, the leaders of the two primary communist nations of the world, Mao Zedong of China and Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, um, did not get along, okay? And Mao will not get along with the person who follows Joseph Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, after Stalin's death in the early 1950s, you'll see the rise of Nikita Khrushchev, who becomes the new Soviet leader. Um, and there was really a difference of philosophy between Khrushchev and Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong believed that it was important for communism to spread throughout the world through violent revolution, very much in the, in the sense, uh, in the same spirit that Karl Marx believed. Um, Khrushchev believed it was dangerous for communists to actively encourage revolution uh, in the you know communist revolution throughout the world because of the danger that it would pose um, with the United States. This kind of thing could result in nuclear war during the nuclear age. So there was philosophical differences 
between these two. Um, Joe, uh, excuse me, uh, Nikita Khrushchev and Mao Zedong are basically going to have a, a major split. And China and the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War uh, are going to be close to going to war on a number of occasions. Uh, this will be something that actually benefits the United States because it gives the U.S. a chance to sort of divide and conquer, so to speak, um, with the two major communist states of the world completely disunified. Um, it it made the, the process of sort of um, taking out communism a little bit easier. Um, Mao Zedong, for his part, is going to need to shift the focus or the emphasis of what's going on in his country um, because he had actually made a lot of mistakes. Like we said, during the five-year plans and the, um, the five-year plans, the, um, the country had suffered tremendous starvation. So he's going to embark on a new policy or a new movement, which he calls the Cultural Revolution, um, because he believes by the 1960s, communism was sort of fading in China. People weren't as, uh, as excited about the movement that he had founded uh, and fought for throughout his life. Remember, this is more than 20 years after the uh, you know, end of the Chinese Civil War. This is more than 20 years after, um, you know, after the communists vanquished Chiang Kai-shek to the island of Taiwan. And Mao himself was getting a little bit older, so there was a desire to sort of re-motivate the revolutionary movement. And the way Mao decides he's going to do this is by closing schools and universities because he sees intellectuals as the enemy of the communist movement inside of China. And that makes a lot of sense because Mao, like all totalitarian leaders, believes that differences of opinion uh, are dangerous because they can't be controlled. So what he's going to seek to do is make everybody sort of be on the same page, everybody believe uh, in the idea that Mao Zedong and his message is the only message worth knowing. So the way he's going to go about doing this here is by establishing a group known to history as the Red Guards. These were 11 million school-aged uh, students, <coughs> young men. Um, Red Guards refers to the idea that these are the guardians of the communist movement. Um, and again, Mao's idea was to seek out and, and, and try to uproot people who uh, maybe quietly believed in capitalism and they had ideas that were different than his. Uh, he saw uh, intellectuals like teachers and professors and other professional people really as the enemy of the state. You see this picture here, the children reading out of Mao's little red book. This book was something given to children at an early age. It contained simple sayings and ideas associated with uh, communism and his control over China. Again, this was just a method of indoctrination, very much the way um, you know, propaganda posters and, and the control of media had been in Stalin's Soviet Union. And even though Hitler's Germany was not communist, it was still totalitarian. You could, you could equate this to something like the Hitler Youth Movement. It's basically a totalitarian method of, of controlling people. Um, so Mao Zedong is going to sick these red guards against professional people. He's going to put them on buses and send them to universities and send them to cities and tell them, give them orders. Anybody you suspect of being a capitalist, drag them out, uh, put them on the bus and send them to work in the fields with their hands for a day. Put them on their hands and knees so that they, so that they work hard with their hands so that they know what it's like to, to do real labor. Um, because his opinion was if you're working hard, you're not coming up with ideas that are against him, meaning Mao. Uh, almost predictably here, the Red Guards themselves are going to get out of control. I mean, if you can imagine uh, taking thousands of young men and telling them to go out into the world or go out into the cities and cause chaos to attack their teachers and things like that, they themselves are going to get out of control. So this whole thing, essentially, this whole cultural revolution, this this movement to sort of reinvigorate excitement about the communist system 
The whole movement's going to sort of get out of control at this point. The Red Guards are going to have to be sent to farms to work so that they can cool down for a while. Because people were so busy, you know, reading out a little red book and things like that, there's going to be more shortages of food, there's going to be violence. Uh, and China's going to be plunged into another period now in the 1960s uh, of severe hardship. So financially or economically here, this whole period, the Cultural Revolution, turns out to be a complete and utter disaster for Mao Zedong. And although he's still nominally going to be the leader, other, other political um, figures, notably uh, an individual by the name of Deng Xiaoping, is, is going to sort of... Um, sort of push Mao into the periphery of the political scene. In other words, he's going to be sort of, he's still going to be the leader, but the important decisions are going to be taken over by others at this point, um, leading into the 1970s. Um, so, moving forward. <clears throat> the Korean War is... The first conflict that follows World War II that the United States Army was involved in, and it sometimes referred to as the Forgotten War, as this monument uh, here indicates, but it's an important conflict because it's really the first full-scale uh, test or exercise of the containment policy. Now... The beginning of the uh, Korean War has to do with the division of the Korean Peninsula uh, into two states. Uh, after World War II, uh, some groups, some people inside Korea wanted communism, some people did not. So uh, the, the decision after negotiation is to divide the country into communist North Korea and non-communist South Korea. And as I said earlier, the the Korean War is the first full-scale exercise of the containment policy after North Korea invaded South Korea. Now, historically speaking, Korea had always been one nation. It, it, it had fought throughout its history to uh, resist uh, Chinese imperialism, and it had remained a, a distinct culture, distinct language, uh, dis you know, distinct uh, political ideas from China and Japan. Although it is a land bridge, it has, it has remained... Uh, a country in and of itself. Uh, so the Koreans themselves, many of them didn't understand why they were now divided into two countries. And North Korea sought to do something about that in 1950 when it invaded South Korea in an attempt to turn the entire country into a communist state. They crossed that 38, 38th parallel, that's a line of latitude that divided the two, the two Koreas. And Harry Truman, the President of the United States now, again, this whole idea of the Truman Doctrine, we're going to assist anybody resisting communism, we're going to contain communism where it doesn't, you know, we're going to prevent it from springing up in places where it doesn't exist. And there was a fear here that if South Korea became communist, then other nations surrounding Korea could become communist, including Japan, maybe some of the Malaysian archipelago, perhaps Australia, and who knows how far uh, ultimately the, com the communist dominoes could fall. So this idea of the domino theory, this is an important term. The idea is the, the belief that if one nation falls to communism, the rest in the immediate vicinity or the geographic area will fall as well. So one of the major reasons why the United States went to war in Korea in the 1950s was to assist the South Koreans who were uh, resisting uh, communism. They were, um, you know, this, this idea of the Truman Doctrine stated that if you're resisting communism, you can expect American help. So we go in, the Korean War is an expression of a couple of theories or ideas that were pretty popular in the U.S. government at the time containment, domino theory, and the Truman Doctrine. So the U.S. becomes the major um, fighting force in the Korean War, although it was a U.N. force that was sent uh, to help the South Koreans. Um, the troops were led by General MacArthur, the same General MacArthur who had led the Pacific War against the Japanese in World War II, the same General MacArthur who had assisted the Japanese <clears throat> in the writing of their new constitution after World War II. Now, when the United States gets involved in the war, 
uh, to assist South Korea, that's actually going to have the effect of bringing China into the war on the side of the North. So you can see here, this represents an escalation. It's becoming a little more dangerous now because now it's not just uh, a small war on the Korean Peninsula that's being fought between two, two, uh, two states. This is now um, a larger conflict. You have the United States assisting South Korea and China assisting North Korea. This is the kind of thing um, that, you know, this is similar to the beginning of the First World War, where a smaller nation gets its, gets its allies involved and it becomes a much bigger conflict. So had the United States and the Chinese actually fought, and in some, some cases they actually did, but um, this, this was becoming uh, a, a larger conflict than I think anybody uh, was willing to commit to. Now, Douglas MacArthur was a general who knew how to get things done. And in his opinion, the United States had the advantage because we had nuclear weapons and we had a lot of them. So in his opinion, why not use nuclear weapons against North Korea and if necessary against China itself um, to simply end the war quickly? And again, Truman had made the decision in the 1940s to use the atomic bombs against Japan because it would save American lives by doing so. Uh, Truman probably wisely here refused. Um, he felt that dropping atomic bombs uh, on Asia twice within one decade was probably uh, not going to be taken very well by people in Asia. And that could mean the Chinese, it could mean the Japanese, it could mean the Koreans. Um, MacArthur and Truman are going to have a very public falling out with one another, meaning they don't agree. And eventually, President Harry Truman's going to have to fire MacArthur. And this is, this is sort of a traumatic thing for the American people. You know, Douglas MacArthur was a hero of war. He had successfully guided the American forces against the Japanese, and now here he was being disrespected by the president. So the Korean War was actually getting messy. Um, it was, again, not something I think the Americans or the Chinese wanted to fully commit to because of what full commitment could mean. Um, the use of nuclear weapons would escalate this conflict to a, to a point uh, where it would be very, very dangerous. So the end of the Korean War really occurs after a stalemate. Neither side can gain a, a real tactical advantage. You, you see some back and forth across the uh, peninsula. The United States, upon initial entry, is going to push the North Koreans out. Then the Chinese are going to get involved and push the U.S. and their South Korean allies back to the 38th parallel. Neither side is prepared to escalate the war, but neither side is willing to give up. So we have a stalemate where neither side really comes out a, a winner. Um, so the decision is made to, to go with the status quo. The 38th parallel was reestablished as the border between North and South Korea. And really to this day, um, it's really no peace, formal peace treaty was signed. There's a ceasefire in effect. Um, and there is a demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea. But even to this day, North Korea remains communist and in some cases militant uh, in their pursuit of nuclear weapons. Uh, and South Korea remains uh, non-communist and an American ally. So turning our attention here back to Eastern Europe, remember what we said, the, the states of Poland, Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, many of these nations um, were what we referred to as satellite states, meaning they were under the political, social, and economic domination of the Soviet Union. So we have to take a look um, really at the 1950s and 60s here at what was going on with those states because it, it wasn't uh, peaceful. Uh, and we also need to look at this concept of peaceful competition with the West. And this was really the idea of Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier who takes over after the death of Joseph Stalin in the early 1950s. So in 1950, Stalin's going to die and his position as leader of the Politburo, the, the high um, communist party in the Soviet Union, uh, this position is going to be filled by Nikita Khrushchev. He was a general during the Second World War. Um, and although he believed in communism, he was not willing to go to war, or at least he said he wasn't willing to go to 
war to to take over other nations this is really where the sort of philosophical division between uh you know the soviet union and china comes about because mao zedong was willing to go to war to to bring about the spread of communism instead khrushchev had this idea of peaceful competition the idea that we're not going to fight with the west the soviet union and the united states aren't going to fight with each other but we will compete we will co we compete in the most important um discipline of the 20th century in particular science so khrushchev's idea here was to show the world that the the centralized planning of the soviet union could more successfully unlock the mysteries of science uh, and outer space and technology uh, in a way that the United States and its free system simply could not. So really the idea here is we're going to show the world uh, in a peaceful way that our way, this is the Soviet Union that is, is in fact better. Um, and this sort of peaceful competition plays out uh, in a number of ways, most notably the space race, which we'll talk about. Now, another thing Khrushchev wanted to do when he came in was he wanted to make it clear he was not another Joseph Stalin. Uh, Khrushchev, although he, he was uh, a powerful leader, he was not a bloodthirsty dictator um, and totalitarian ruler like Joseph Stalin was. Um, Khrushchev wanted to make it clear to the satellite states, countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia, that, you know, he was going to have a gentler hand. He was not going to dominate them to the same degree that Stalin had, basically hold a gun to their head and, you know, or else. Um, and the Poles very quickly after Khrushchev came to power, the Poles rebelled and many of the workers um, inside the Polish nation wanted to handle their own affairs basically more degree of self-government less directives from moscow and the soviet union um and khrushchev gives in yeah, after this this kind of reform after this small rebellion in poland in 1956 khrushchev gives in because he wants to make a point that he's not the same as stalin so as long as poland stays a part of the warsaw pact defensive alliance against the west the poles could have a little more degree of self-government Now, another thing going on here was the beginning of the space race. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched the first satellite into outer space. It was called Sputnik. Um, this thing is going to send shockwaves through the United States, a tremendous amount of fear, because there was a tremendous amount of trepidation that the United States was losing the technological edge that it had over the Soviet Union. Um, Sputnik was just a, you know, a spherical metal ball that orbited the United States that emitted a small beeping sound that if you turned an AM radio to at a certain time of day when it was over overhead, you could pick this thing up. And it was a scary thought. Nobody really understood what Sputnik was. They didn't know, if, did it have weapons on it? Was it listening? Was it, you know, what was it doing up there? It was just orbiting around. Were they spying on us with this thing? So there was a tremendous amount of fear because... The United States had not yet launched anything into space. As a matter of fact, the U.S. had tried to launch. Uh, Sputnik was about the size of a basketball. The United States, um, about a month after Sputnik went up, a month or so, uh, tries to launch an even more primitive satellite about the size of a baseball into outer space, and the rocket winds up exploding. Uh, it's a dismal failure. So th there really is a lot of fear that the Soviet Union not only was technologically superior, but it probably soon would be able to send, you know, missiles tipped with uh, atomic warheads to the United States. Um, the 1950s, you're seeing the beginning of the intercontinental ballistic missile, basically a missile that can go from one, you know, continent to another, flying thousands of miles to hit a designated target. So you're seeing a lot of things going on here with, with, between the space race, the United States, you know, trying to compete with the Soviet Union. Um, you're seeing the beginning of the arms race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union here. And all these are, are sort of hallmark ideas associated with the Cold War. Um, so it, for a little while, at least, it definitely seems that <clears throat> Khrushchev's idea of peaceful competition was paying off because it really did appear that the Soviet Union was gaining an edge. 
Now, in the satellite states, we already said that Poland had had a successful reform movement in 1956, and Khrushchev gave into it, allowed more um, self-government to the people of Poland, less intrusion by the Soviet Union or Moscow, uh, with the stipulation that <coughs> they had to remain a part of the, the Warsaw Pact alliance. Uh, so Hungary is shortly after going to test the waters to see how far they can push, um, you know, basically push uh, Khrushchev to see how much he would give up. Um, as it turns out, after this movement in 1956 in Hungary, after the people demanding change and reform demand uh, an exit from the Warsaw Pact military alliance, uh, that was actually one step too far. And Khrushchev is basically going to betray himself here and send in the tanks uh, to put down this movement. And this has a, a major effect on the people of Eastern Europe because throughout all of this time with Khrushchev where he was talking about um, being different than Stalin, he had a program called de-Stalinization, which is not going to be the same way, I'm not a you know crazy maniac leader. Um, as it turns out, he was very, very uh, willing uh, to violently put down a popular uprising as soon as they threatened the security of the Warsaw Pact. So this is going to have major effect on the rest of Eastern Europe. Um, it, it definitely shows the limits of how far uh, Khrushchev was willing to go in terms of change or reform for those uh, satellite state countries. Uh, and it's going to really um, change the relationship between the Soviet Union and its satellite states for another decade or so. Now, what was happening in East Berlin was that a lot of people were leaving. People were leaving East Berlin and the, the drudgery of living under communism to go to West Berlin, where it was uh, a, a Western uh, capitalist democratic state. Um, they had freedom of music, freedom of speech, um, bright lights, big city, Western Berlin. It was an exciting place. Uh, and the people who lived in the East could look across the block and see the difference. It was actually tangible. It was obvious how different it was to live under Soviet-style communism on one side of the block and democratic, you know, capitalism on the other side. Um, so people were simply leaving. People were going to, and they would, what they would do is they would walk to West Berlin, get on a plane, and fly to the free world, basically. Um, and this was happening at an alarming rate. Um, many of the best and the brightest people were, that were highly educated, people that had skills of, of differing kinds, would leave the East for more opportunities in the West. So Nikita Khrushchev is actually going to order the construction of a wall. This is going to be known to history as the Berlin Wall. It's built in 19... The beginning of it is built in 1961. And the idea is to seal off East Berlin from the West. Now this... This does a couple of things at the same time. First of all, it, 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 it's sort of a propaganda victory for the West because they're actually building a wall to keep their people in. So symbolically here, or metaphorically, it's almost as if Berlin or East Berlin is a giant prison. Um, so it sort of speaks volumes about the differences between living under communism versus, you know, our way. Um, but what it does do is it sort of stabilizes the situation. Um, there was a lot of tension over what was going to be done in Berlin. You know, were we going to go to war over this kind of thing? Um, and although the Berlin Wall becomes a hated symbol of repression and oppression, um, it does at least temporarily sort of um, stabilize the situation so a larger conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union does not break out. Moving forward here in the 1960s, you see the same kind of thing that happened in Bulgaria, uh, excuse me, in Hungary, happened in Czechoslovakia. Uh, this movement, um, you know, Prague Springs, this communism with a human face, they want more liberal policy, they want more self-government, similar to what the Poles had received in 1956. By this time, Nikita Khrushchev was not even the leader of the Soviet Union anymore. It was a, another guy by the name of Leonid Brezhnev, um, and he was very quick to send in the tanks. Um, 
so again, it's just it's just a demonstration that the Soviet Union was very um, sensitive about the about the satellite states, the idea that they wanted to preserve this buffer zone between Western democracy and and their way uh, in Eastern Europe. So anytime uh, a particular state got out of line and demanded more reform than the Soviets were willing to give, they were willing to use force and violence to put it down. So you see an example of that. Uh, in 1968, Czechoslovakia, just as earlier, you had seen an example of it in 1956 in Hungary. And it didn't matter who the leader was, whether it was, you know, Khrushchev or th this new leader, Brezhnev. Um, ultimately, the idea is they're willing to use force to preserve the satellite state system. Now... A lot of what we've been talking about was occurring in places far, far away from the United States. It was one thing to have East Berlin and West Berlin divided. It was another thing to have a war in Korea. But when communism comes to a small island 90 miles off the coast of Florida, uh, that's another story altogether. Um, and we kind of call this section too close for comfort. Uh, mostly because this was the the event, the the Cuban Missile Crisis and the situation with Fidel Castro in Cuba, that brings the world closer to World War III and ultimately nuclear annihilation, um, closer than it ever has before or probably since. As we said, Cuba is located 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Um, we had supported uh, a, a dictator in Cuba prior to Castro's revolution to overthrow that dictator. Um, this is going to basically gain um, the anger of the United States towards Castro. Basically, he's another dictator, but he overthrew our dictator, is the idea. So the United States is going to very quickly become an enemy of Fidel Castro. Um, and for protection, Castro will seek the support of the Soviet Union. Um, so basically, our anger is going to drive Fidel Castro into the arms of the Soviet Union. Uh, you see the picture down to the lower right. That's Castro uh, holding hands there with Nikita Khrushchev in a, show, in, a, in a showing of unity and support for one another. It's basically a demonstration of the alliance that becomes... Uh, very real after 1959 between Cuba and the Soviet Union. U.S. is not going to take kindly to the alliance between Cuba and the Soviet Union. We're going to break off all trade with Cuba, which is something that continues to this day. Castro is going to do everything he can to turn Cuba into a full-blown communist state. And because the United States government believed in that idea that we referred to as the domino theory... Um, there's a real fear here that if Cuba becomes communist, what about the rest of Latin America? What about, you know, what about South America? What about Mexico? Uh, what about other Caribbean islands? You know, there's a fear that, you know, communism is getting a little too close to home. Now there's communism right in our backyard. It's not Korea anymore. It's not Europe anymore. This is very, very, very close to, Ch um, very close to Florida. So what are we going to do now? Well, President John F. Kennedy um, trained a group of Cuban exiles, people who had left Cuba because they were unhappy with the situation. Um, the CIA is going to train these individuals to invade Cuba to overthrow Castro. Um, because the U.S. needed to claim plausible deniability, we couldn't provide air support. Uh, the idea here is if, if there were U.S. Air Force planes supporting this invasion to overthrow Cuba, then it becomes really obvious that the United States was involved in this plan to overthrow uh, Castro, and maybe that could lead to Soviet involvement. So we needed to pretend we knew nothing about it. So nothing these exiles are, are going to have is going to have like an American flag on it or anything like that. It's, it's going to be weapons that are unmarked, you know, not, not American style uniforms or anything like that. Um, but the idea is supposed to be that this is um, a homegrown Cuban invasion, that the CIA had nothing to do with it. Um, because the U.S. couldn't promise air support, the Bay of Pigs invasion was actually a failure. It was a disaster, and it becomes very obvious very quickly that they were trained um, after they were interrogated. 
very obvious that they are trained by the United States and the CIA and the Kennedy administration. Uh, and Castro at this point freaks out because it becomes very obvious that the U.S. is doing everything it can to try to destroy him. So he's going to seek help from his Soviet ally, um, something that could dissuade or prevent future American attacks on his country. And by 1962, we get to what we refer to as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Castro and Khrushchev began to build Soviet Cuba to deter further U.S. involvement. That means sending missiles to Cuba. Missile installations in Cuba contain nuclear weapons, and because of the closeness to Florida, nuclear warheads could easily be launched to the United States. John F. Kennedy realizes now that there are cute there are nuclear weapons pointed directly at the heart of the united states and this is happening during his presidency so he's going to basically send an ultimatum to cuba uh get the missiles out within two weeks or else and that or else means the united states will invade cuba and remove the missiles for them now this is a major 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 issue and act if, if the United States was to invade Cuba, that would be an act of war that the Soviet Union would have to defend. Cuba was a close ally of the Soviet Union, and Nikita Khrushchev would have to defend his ally. So Kennedy's going to order this naval blockade, meaning nothing goes into or out of Cuba. You have Soviet ships um, carrying nuclear weapons. You have American battleships with weapons pointed at the ships. This is a bad situation that could go, that could get worse any second. Um, so Kennedy sends, and his administration sends this ultimatum to Cuba and the Soviet Union. If you do not remove the missiles within two weeks, we are invading and removing them for you. Um, this two-week period is sometimes referred to as the world being at the brink of nuclear war because the U.S. was prepared to go in, and had we done that, the Soviet Union would have gotten involved, this would have escalated, and very possibly turned into a nuclear exchange between the two superpowers, which would have effectively ended the world. Um, so thankfully, cooler heads are going to prevail here, and there will not be a nuclear war. At the last moment, Khrushchev is going to agree to remove the missiles with the pledge that the U.S. will never invade Cuba again. So the compromise here is the U.S. won't invade Cuba ever again, we'll leave Castro alone, sort of, and the Soviet Union will take the missiles out of America's backyard. There's also a separate, quiet, um, basically a secret deal. The United States had uh, short-range missiles in Turkey that were pointed at the Soviet Union. Khrushchev wanted those out too, so we do take those out, but that's not a public thing. This actually winds up looking like a major uh, victory for the Kennedy administration. Uh, John F. Kennedy basically, you know, he, he played chicken with Nikita Khrushchev and won. Um, and as a result of this, the, Kennedy's popularity is actually going to skyrocket, and Khrushchev is actually going to lose the support of many of the highest members of the Politburo. And very shortly after, 1964, you're going to see his removal from office, and he will be replaced uh, by, the we mentioned him earlier, Leonid Brezhnev, who will be the, the premier of the Soviet Union for the rest of the 1960s and 70s and into the early 1980s. Just as Korea uh, was an act of containment and an act of the Truman Doctrine, remember, containment means... We are not going to let communism spring up where it doesn't already exist. And the Truman Doctrine is anybody, any free people fighting against communism can expect American support. Just as the Korean War was a, a reflection of the Truman Doctrine and containment, so was the Vietnam War. Only these were two, you know, with the exception that both of these places, Vietnam and Korea, are in uh, Asia. Um, these are actually two very different situations with two very different outcomes. Uh, just the way Korea had been divided uh, through international uh, treaty, had been divided into communism in the north and, and that capitalist democracy in the south, uh, Vietnam is going to be divided in a very similar fashion only a year later. This is actually going to come after uh, a French colonial war. Uh, Vietnam had uh, previously been a French colony, 
and it was um, fought for at the end of World War II. The French didn't want to give up on their colonies just yet. But after about 10 years or nine years of fighting, uh, the, <clears throat> the French are going to give up. And the United States government's going to be a little alarmed at this because it seems like Korea, w excuse me, it seems like Vietnam would be a place where communism could spring up because of the rampant poverty. So the U.S. is going to assume responsibility for the situation in Vietnam out of the fear of the domino theory, meaning China's communist, North Korea's communist, you know, maybe the Vietnamese will become communist too. Uh, the United States does this in a kind of high-handed manner, and it has the impact of alienating uh, many of the many of the Vietnamese people. Um, and some of the efforts of the U.S. government to sort of prop up so-called democratic governments in South Vietnam are going to be seen rather transparently as false. Um, it's basically American power and Amer the American military propping up supposed Democrats, really people who were um, dictators. And this is going to alienate the people of many of the people of Vietnam, and it's going to drive them into the arms of Ho Chi Minh, who became a communist leader, um, and he received aid from China and the Soviet Union. And he really becomes a nationalist leader here in the sense that many of the people see the southern Vietnamese government as a sham, something that's not real, something that's really just a tool of American imperialism. Um, so a lot of people who considered themselves true Vietnamese nationalists are going to support um, are going to support Ho Chi Minh. This is unfortunate because, you know, if you look at it from the point of view of the United States, the domino theory seemed very real. You know, China was the most populous country on earth, and it was communist. You know, North Korea was communist, and and there was some credence, there was some some reality to the idea that if Vietnam falls to communism, what of Cambodia, what of Thailand, what of Malaysia, what, what about, you know, could it spread to Australia? So, you know, it's a difficult situation, and the American government uh, did what it felt it needed to do to prevent the spread of communism, even if some of those efforts uh, were, were clumsy and misunderstood. The Viet Cong were a southern Vietnamese communist that supported the North. Remember, communism in the north of Vietnam, non-communism in the south. But when we use the term Viet Cong, we're referring to people who actually lived in the south who supported the north. Uh, they used guerrilla warfare. That meant hiding behind trees, digging tunnels, anything they could to prevent um, an out-and-out -out battle against superior forces. Uh, so they attacked supply lines, they used snipers, things like that. Um, what really happens here in the early 1960s, very much the way North Korea had invaded South Korea, which draws the U.S. into that conflict, North Vietnam is going to invade South Vietnam to try to overthrow um, the government that had been really set up there by the U.S. Um, it's at this point, really in 1964, the United States be begins sending troops to South Vietnam to sort of support the government from being completely overrun by the North. Um, American troops become engaged in military action in Vietnam after 1964 um, through the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson. Okay. Uh, the Vietnam War is really an in, becomes extraordinarily unpopular towards the later part of the 1960s when it becomes clear um, that not everybody was really telling the truth about what was going on in the country. Um, the Vietnam War, and because of the draft and other things like that, becomes sort of a major part of the counterculture movement of the 1960s and a major reason why Lyndon B. B. Johnson doesn't seek uh, election um, after 1968. So, uh, really, the Vietnam War is going to become Richard Nixon's problem, and eventually the Vietnam War will end in the early 1970s with a negotiated peace, but it's not a peace that prevents the eventual takeover of South Vietnam from the North. So, the, the Vietnam experience is, going, is really historically going to be remembered as a really negative one because of the 
the horrible loss of life for the American service people and also because event ultimately the goal was not achieved. All of Vietnam became communist and it in some senses remains communist today. So the US will withdraw from Vietnam and South Vietnam will fall to communism uh, by 1975 or so. Now, this kind of situation escalates a little bit. And this was one argument in favor of the US staying in Vietnam because with the presence of American, the American military in, in Vietnam, it actually sort of had the effect of propping up the government of Cambodia, which was located right next door. Um, after the U.S. leaves, the government of Cambodia is going to collapse, and you're going to see the rise of the Khmer Rouge, which is um, a really, really radical form of communism that takes control in 1975. Pol Pot, the leader of the Khmer Rouge, is a totalitarian leader who is a complete fanatic, uh, every bit as murderous and violent as Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, um, every bit uh, wholesale murder of political opponents and people he saw as city dwellers. Um, he, he essentially tried to reestablish a, an agricultural way of life, um, you know, a non-urban way of life where people lived communally. Um, but the sum total of, of his political radicalism was such that 4 million people died between the years 1975 and 79. It actually gets so bad that Vietnam, which was another communist nation now after 1975, is actually going inter, to intervene and overthrow the Khmer Rouge. Um, so this is just an example of, you know, things are sometimes more complicated than they seem, you know. Was it good? Was it bad that the United States was involved in Southeast Asia and Vietnam during the 1960s or 70s? You could say it's bad, certainly, because, you know, there, there was some dishonesty going on and a lot of people lost their lives. But you can also say that without American power, look what came up. Pol Pot was every bit as big a monster of the 20th century as Adolf Hitler. So, you know, had the U.S. stayed, perhaps this murderous, you know, lunatic hadn't, wouldn't have existed or taken power. Um, you know, it's important to, to sort of see things from every angle here. And the unfortunate reality is, is that it's a very, very difficult situation. Now, just kind of wrapping up the discussion of the early part of the Cold War here from the 40s through the early 70s, it becomes clear that the Cold War is really expensive. Um, all the missiles, all the wars, Korea, Vietnam, the space race, all these things cost a lot of money. And really, by the 1970s, the early 70s, um, the U.S. and the Soviet Union can't afford it anymore. So Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev uh, and uh, Richard Nixon's advisor, Henry Kissinger, are going to devise this idea of detente. Detente is a U.S. policy. It was originally intended to put pressure on northern Vietnam. The idea here w was to... Um, sort of cool down tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union so that um, the Vietnamese can't expect help from the Soviet Union. But what it really does is it calls for a relaxation of tensions with the Soviet Union. So for a short period of time, there's going to be some kind of mild cooperation between the USSR. This is going to come by way of student exchanges. Soviet students will study in America and American students will study in the Soviet Union. You'll see the reduction of, uh, the reduction of certain kinds of nuclear weaponry, uh, like you see with the SALT agreements. Uh, SALT there stands for Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. It's not actually a reduction of the amount of missiles that are out there, but it, it was a negotiated... Uh, reduction in the amount of missiles that could be produced by either country. Um, you're even, you're even going to see Nixon visiting communist China and restoring diplomatic relations. Remember what we said after, uh, way back in the late 1940s there, when Chiang Kai-shek was banished to Taiwan, the United States did not accept the existence of communist China, meaning we had no diplomats communicating with China. 
Um, so there was basically just a giant void um, in relations between the U.S. and China. Well, that kind of ends in 1972. Richard Nixon's going to go to China. He's going to meet Mao Zedong. There's, there's going to be some degree of cooperation between the Chinese and the Americans. Um, this kind of, some of this stuff makes Nixon look really good. And we do see a, a sort of temporary warming up uh, of uh, relations between the U.S. Um, and the Soviet Union, in particular with the situation in the Middle East, which we'll talk about. But there's going to be cooperation between the United States and Soviet Union in trying to bring peace to the Arab-Israeli conflict, which, again, it's certainly not over. But it does demonstrate that for a time period in the 1970s, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were trying to um, lessen the the Cold War a little bit because of the expense that it had ultimately incurred. But all of that ends in 1979. Um, so again, detente is not the end of the Cold War. It's just a temporary period in the 70s where the U.S. and the Soviet Union tried to get along a little better. Um, but that's going to end in 1979 when the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan in an attempt to transform that country into communism or into a communist state. Uh, the U.S. is going to supply uh, Afghan rebels, um, which, will event, which will repeatedly defeat the Soviets. And the war in Afghanistan is actually going to be a major reason for the failure of the Soviet economy in the 1980s, which will eventually, partially, uh, lead to the ultimate dissolution or the end of the Soviet Union in the early 1990s. Um, although it's not all good news here, because look at who, who we were arming here, these Afghan forces. Uh, one of the Afghan rebels who were fighting the Soviets in the 70s and 80s was a guy by the name of Osama bin Laden. Um, uh, our government, in some senses, trained and equipped him to defeat the Soviets and, in many senses, created a monster. So that's something to think about. And again, as I said earlier, sometimes these situations uh, become more complicated than they initially seem. Okay. So in this unit, we've talked about a lot of things. And it's really only the first part of the Cold War unit um, that I kind of do the Cold War as two different units. This was the first part. We'll talk about the end of the Cold War in, in Unit 8. Um, so ultimately, what we've talked about here. Um, in the post-World War II Balance of Power Unit, Unit 7, is the beginnings of the Cold War from its origins at the Yalta Conference. We've talked about Cold War terminology like the Truman Doctrine, containment, the Marshall Plan, the zones of German occupation, which eventually formed two separate German states, the Federal Republic of Germany, which is our Germany, and the German Democratic, uh, German Democratic Republic, which is the um, Soviet Germany or Communist Germany. Uh, we talked about what went on in Eastern Europe during this, you know, the, with the satellite states, everything from the conflict in Hungary and Czechoslovakia. We mentioned the space race. Uh, this whole idea of peaceful cooperation with the West. We also talked about communism in China and the idea uh, that Mao Zedong's philosophy was a little bit different than what the Soviet philosophy of communism was, and that leads to a breakup or a split between the Soviet Union and China, even though they're both communists, doesn't make them friends. We talked about some of the changes that Mao Zedong made in China during his time in power, including the five-year plans, and the uh, Cultural Revolution. We talked about the Korean War. We spoke about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we took a look at the Vietnam War and the results of the Vietnam War with the uh, spreading of communism into neighboring Cambodia and the um, radical Khmer Rouge um, regime, which takes over under the leadership of Pol Pot. Um, and then we looked briefly at detente, which is this, this period of um, temporary improved relations between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 1970s, which ultimately ends with, this, with the Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan. So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed and study. See you in the next unit.